exposition of John, since some of you are not present for the 3 o'clock service, didn't want to go back to John, want to do something different. So Matthew 25 is where we're going to be this morning. And it's interesting that Brother Mitchell closed his um, exposition of Habakkuk's prophecy being prepared for the great and coming day of the Lord. He was um, reading to us hymn 609 in the Trinity, that great day. Oh, my oh Lord, prepare my soul for that great day. Because preparation is going to be the theme of our message this morning. So it's a wonderful dovetail between the Sunday school lesson and the um, dovetail joint, that is, for the woodworkers, into the morning message now. So by way of introduction, this, this parable of the ten virgins that we read previously um, is couched between two other parables. And we read here that the kingdom of heaven will be like, in verse 1, ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, as we look into this, your holy word, we pray that you would uh, give to us illumination into it, that you would write it upon our hearts, that with the light of your word we would walk in this dark world upright before you. Pray that you would help us, Lord, to prepare us. Help us to be uh, diligent, zealous with all this time that you have given to us to ever make preparations for that great day, to be ready and watchful for your return. You have already come once and fulfilled your promise. You have promised to come again. And Lord, we are between the two comings. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to consider that seriously, that we would ponder uh, this, the immortal state or the state of our immortal souls before you. We pray that you would uh, guide us into your word now, uh, that you would glorify yourself. Amen. This parable is preceded by Jesus' warning that no man knows the hour or even the day of his second coming, despite Many professing Christians, theologians, trying to predict that day, no one knows. No one has guessed. Their guess is in the future still. Um, Isaac Newton said 2060. Um, he isn't right either. Spoiler alert. Um, and this truth is immediately illustrated by the parable of a master who sets a steward over his house. A wise steward, as we read, will be attending to the needs of the house, whereas a foolish steward will be uh, using his master's absence as an opportunity to revel with drunkards, to deal violently with, the, with his fellow servants. And immediately following this parable of the ten virgins, we have the parable of the talents, in which a man going away uh, leaves some of his goods in the hands of three stewards, and they know what they're to do. They're to be industrious so that the man might have a profit from his goods upon his return and that the stewards might share in the gain of their master. And the man did not return until a long time had passed. We read there in Matthew 25, verse 19. And this language mirrors the term delayed, which was used in each of the two preceding parables. We will note verse 48 of chapter 24, where the where the wicked servant says to himself, my master's delayed. And then in verse 5 of Matthew 25, uh, as the bridegroom was delayed. So there's a similar similarity in, of language here. And all three of these successive parables converge upon a singular point. It's pretty obvious even in just a, a reading of the text that we are to be prepared for the second coming often called the parousia of Jesus. This parousia being his uh, arrival, his coming presence. We're to be ready for it. And it seems to us as though he delays. All of you sitting before me, with the exception of my infant son back there, have lived years upon this earth. And Jesus has not returned yet. We haven't seen him yet. This is not the eternal state. We're not hyperpreterists because it's unbiblical. And we're not in the presence of our Savior in glory yet. 
And so we, we assume to ourselves, so far all of the days of my life, he hasn't come back, and eh, pretty good chance he won't come back tomorrow. And that is exactly the point of Jesus' statement. No man knows the day or the hour. No man knows. Countless multitudes, including Christians, live their lives from day to day as if Jesus will not return that day. And on that, and one day, the majority will be wrong. And it will not matter how many days they were right previously. And so I believe this is why many people professing Christians and pagans alike, it's interesting, are interested in trying to predict the end of this world. Or in, in Christian terms, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting how, how many times that Christians get involved in or um, closely associated with movements, groups that try to pin down when is the exact time of the return of Jesus Christ. And the pagans... Two, I remember December uh, 21st, 2012, the Mayan calendar, and uh, they had predicted the end of the world, and we had some neighbors that were you know, doomsday preppers and all that. And So I was talking to them one day while they were out there doing their prepping, and I said, so the world's going to end in like a week or so, right? Well, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what it says. I said, okay, here we go. I said, why don't you, since the world's ending, just go ahead and will me all your material possessions. you got a pretty nice car out there. Just go ahead and will me all of it. I mean, the world's going to end. You're not going to need it, right? But for some reason, he refused to do that. But he still went on prepping. So, Some people are comfortable with their, uh, with their own hypocrisy. But anyway, the pagans want to live the life they want to live without having to be constantly prepared for a sudden interruption by the one whom they know will judge them for the life they live. And so there's an, interest, there's an interest on their part. They want to know when he's coming back. Christians, too, that professing Christians, want to know, too, because they really want to live in sin and then have some kind of advance notice. Okay, some signs, some kind of something in the world going on, world events, so that I can clean my act up real quick and be ready to meet the Lord. That's altogether foolishness. Altogether foolishness foolishness they want those warning signs so they can quickly believe the gospel ask for his forgiveness and barely made it in barely made it into glory this is not how Jesus calls us to live he obliterates all attempts to predict his return no man knows the day or the hour and calls us to seek him while he may be found today is the day of salvation Repent and believe the gospel. Live a holy life that brings glory to him. Lay up treasures in heaven. As many days as he gives you to lay them up, lay them up. Be ready for that eternal state. Those who want to spend their whole lives sinning and then make some hasty sort of repentance right before the end, they're not God's children. How do we know? They don't bear fruit. They don't love him. They don't live like him. They don't worship him. They love their sin they just don't want to go to hell for it. And so they want the warning signs. And that's why these movements and these groups are so popular. But just faithfully preaching through the Bible, faithfully daily trusting the Lord for His grace, for His blood to cleanse me, just to live another day working in His world, in my little quiet corner of the earth, that's not appealing to people. Not appealing. It is to the Lord's people. We're grateful He gives us anything to do. But those who make such plans for their life, a plan to repent quickly at the end, evidence that they are not the children of the Lord. They don't love Him. They don't live for Him. That No one goes to heaven because they're afraid of hell. The only people who go to heaven are those who love Jesus. And they love Him because He first loved them. That's why. And this is, of course, perfectly consistent with Jesus saving some in the 11th hour. The thief on the cross sinned his whole life. And then the Lord regenerated him right there, it, literally in his final hour. And the Lord saved him. So the Lord does save some at different times. 
But we are not, but just the thief on the cross is the exception. That's not the model by which we live our lives. We don't wait till we're on death row to finally get things right with the Lord. We get things right with the Lord now and keep short accounts with Him. Don't deceive yourself by thinking you can live your whole life for yourself and your, in, your, in your final hour you will finally turn to Jesus. You do not know how suddenly either death will come upon you or the victorious Christ will return. None of us knows that. And because none of us knows that and none of us can find that out, precisely why we're to be prepared at every moment of the day to meet the Lord, to live in light of His second coming. That is why these parables are before us. None of us knows any more than another how soon our Lord will return. And this doesn't mean that we are to to misuse this life that He's given us. No. Time is an earthly tool that we must use to prepare us for a timeless heaven. That's how we're to employ it. To look at time. So such preparation is the theme, the the subject of our text before us. So by way of an outline, Pastor Little wants me to have outlines in my sermons, and and he's not even here to get the outline this time. But I've got one if he he listens to this. I've got an outline this time. (laughs) I usually forget when he's here, but I got one today. The first point is the bridegroom is surely coming. That's point number one. Verse number 1, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. They went to meet the bridegroom because he was coming. Matthew is unique of the gospel writers in using the term kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven will be like. The other gospels use the term kingdom of God. and Both are essentially synonymous. I think it's interesting that Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven because Matthew wrote for what? A Jewish audience. And he's referring to a kingdom of heaven, a realm that is not some dirt in the Middle East, east of the Mediterranean Sea. He's referring to the kingdom of heaven as that spiritual kingdom, the true kingdom of God made up of his elect from all nations, all parts of the earth. So Matthew uses this term frequently. It appears in 32 different verses in his gospel. And it refers to the reign of Jesus Christ among his people. Certainly, as Brother Mitchell pointed out very well in the Sunday school lesson, Jesus is sovereign in his reign over the whole world. But the whole world is not presently his kingdom fully realized. It's made up of those who uh, rejoice to be ruled over by him and those who rebel against his rule over them. He is sovereign over the world as its creator, but he is king in the hearts of those who love him and serve him as their king, who live for him. And so when the Gospels speak of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God being like something, they are saying this is how the rule of Jesus Christ advances in the lives of his people as he conquers sinful rebels, calls his sheep to himself. And the kingdom of heaven grows closer to its final state in this way. The church grows horizontally as regenerated sinners are added to the number. Souls are born again under the preaching of the gospel. And it grows vertically as those same born again souls are sanctified by drawing closer and closer to God, becoming more like Him as they attend upon the means of grace. And when the temple of the Old Covenant was being built, in 1 Kings 6-7 we read, It was with stone prepared at the quarry, so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. In New Covenant terms, the kingdom of heaven is like the hammering of the saints here on earth, because there's no hammering in heaven above. We're hammered out down here. We're sanctified down here by the different trials, the different tests, the different series of events that the Lord brings us through in our lives. So we're hammered out down here, made fit for heaven, prepared for heaven, like those stones were prepared at the quarry to be used in the building of the temple. The kingdom of heaven is like 
The kingdom of heaven advances in this way. The kingdom of heaven is the gathered company of all God's perfected saints built into the new Jerusalem, the holy city that Pastor Lil has been working through with us during the Sunday school out in Revelation 21 and 22, the bride of the Lamb. To come back around to our parable here. The kingdom of heaven is advancing when souls are ready and prepared to meet their returning king. The kingdom of heaven will be like, like what? Ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now for our western minds, this seems like a strange ceremony. Why are ten virgins with lamps going to meet a bridegroom? Good question. These virgins, it would would have been in the Middle East, uh, as part of the Jewish wedding, these virgins would have been friends of the bride who were with her on her wedding night. We might call them something, something like bridesmaids. But their job was to wait on the announcement of the bridegroom. They would go out to meet him at night after the, um, the bride price, the dowry had all been settled. The bridegroom was going to come take his bride and bring her out of her father's house and into his house to be with him, to take his bride to himself. And so they would go out to meet this bridegroom, escort him to the bride, and then lead a, a processional back to his house. And because it was at night, they would have their torches to light the way. They didn't have street lights and Alabama power like we do, so they would light the way with these torches. It was a ceremony. Even now at weddings today, some will take little lights, um, no, fl- no open flames, but little battery-operated lights, and they'll wave those, shine those as the uh, bride and groom are leaving the place of the wedding reception, going to the, to the getaway car to go to their honeymoon. We still do that. That's not really a processional. But this was. This was a processional with, with great lights. And the bridegroom came sometime during the night. They couldn't text him to tell him when he was on his way, so they had a lookout appointed to announce the bridegroom's coming. The bridegroom is coming. And it was the job of these virgins, these bridesmaids, to provide the light for this processional. That was their role, their job, their duty, their responsibility. And these lamps, I'm reading from the ESV, some translations might say torches. That's closer to what it was. It would have essentially been an oil-soaked rag on a handle of some sort. And the oil... Uh, the Greek word is literally olive oil, it would be reapplied to keep the torch burning. And and because it was oil, it burned bright, but it also burned quick. So you had to keep adding oil to keep the torch going. It wasn't a a, um, a long-burning, slow-burning light. It had to be continually have uh, oil added to it. And so these virgins are taking their lamps, they're going to meet the bridegroom going to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom is, of course, certainly Jesus. Make spiritual application. Certainly is Jesus. He's already referred in this gospel to himself as the bridegroom in Matthew 9, verse 14. Matthew 9, verse 14, a few pages back. Then the disciples of John came to him, that is Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Verse 15, And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Alluding to himself as the bridegroom. And then in Matthew 22, verse 2, Matthew 22, verse 2, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. His son is being married. His son is the son of God. His son is Jesus, the bridegroom. The king here referring to God the Father. And then in Revelation 21, 9, history ends on this note, the history of the Bible and the history of our world, it ends on this note of the bridegroom 
receiving his bride to himself. Revelation 21, verse 9, that Pastor Little has been working through with us. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And so here at the end of all things, the Lamb takes his bride to himself. Because really, what is history? But the winning of the bride of the Son of God to himself. The Son of God winning his bride to himself. That's what history is all about. And so we must remember that when Jesus comes again, he's already come once, when he comes again, it is as a bridegroom coming for his bride. He will be glad to come and take his bride for himself. And those who are prepared will be glad to meet him. A bridegroom coming for his bride is not someone who drags their feet and walking slowly, not you know coming with reluctance. No. <laughs> the bridegroom is eager to take the bride to himself eager to take the bride to himself. Some of you may have only been engaged a few months, some years maybe, but we were men, we weren't we not happy, were you not happy to take your bride to yourself? Jesus will be too. And so he's coming back gladly because he loves his bride and how eagerly he awaits to come for her. Are you eager to have him return? The bridegroom's coming. Point number one, the bridegroom is surely coming. We'll pick up verse 2 of our text. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now, four or five of the virgins to be wise and five foolish, they have much in common. We read verses 3 and verse 4. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So we're told five are wise, five are foolish, and then we're given one way, one way in which they are different. Just one. One way that that we distinguish the foolish from the wise. All ten of them had the right time. This is the night of the wedding. All ten of them had the right place. They were gathered together. One of them wasn't off at some other place, got the address wrong. No, they're all at the same place. They all knew what was expected of them. They're going to light the processional back to the house of the bridegroom. They all brought a torch for that. But what made the five virgins foolish was that knowing what was expected of them... They failed to adequately plan for the fulfillment of their duty. It's the only difference between the two of them. Five had oil prepared to keep their torches burning for the duration of the processional. Five had no oil at all. Took no oil with them. They were unprepared. And so the foolish virgins teach us that we must be careful of assuming that we're ready. They thought they were. They thought they were. So what is the oil here? Well, commentators will go round and round, different things that it, that it is. I believe it's the indwelling Holy Spirit and the resultant holy life before the Lord that makes us prepared. There is no Holy Spirit without a concurrent life. There's no holy life without the Holy Spirit. The two always come as a package deal. Anointing with oil in the Bible was often used to depict the Holy Spirit's special presence on an individual. A priest, maybe, or a king. Whether or not the Holy Spirit has regenerated you is what separates you from those who are not with Christ at the marriage feast. 
The difference is made by the sovereign regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Those who are outside in darkness are the unregenerate. Those who lack the Holy Spirit. Anointing is is used in the New Testament. We are Christians. We are those filled with the Holy Spirit. Christened with the Holy Spirit as it were. And each one of those who are with the bridegroom at his wedding feast are those who have been regenerated, indwelt, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 9 could not be clearer. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. That's why I can say to them, I don't know you. They don't belong to him. They don't have his Spirit which seals all those for whom he died. But it's also important to note that the parables immediately preceding and the parable immediately following this parable highlight the duties and responsibilities that we have to do while the bridegroom is absent. In order that men may see your good works, glorify your Father in heaven, let your light shine like the light of the five wise virgins. We are called to live a life of holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We will not take part at His wedding feast without it. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And if we have the Holy Spirit, He will make us to strive for this. So we are called to strive. If we are not, then we... We must assume we are asleep, unprepared to meet the bridegroom. If he says we are to strive for it and without him we will not meet him, then we cannot expect to meet him unless we are striving for it, unless we've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We are bearing the fruits of the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit. If not, we're unprepared. The the indwelling Holy Spirit is evidenced by a sincere outward religion. It's what we need to be prepared to meet the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, an unprepared fool is one who professes to have the Holy Spirit but lives an unholy life. Says, well, you know, I, I, I asked the Lord to come into my heart. Not biblical language, by the way. I asked Him to come into my heart. I asked Him to you know, forgive me. And then ever since that moment, it's been completely living for themselves, for what they wanted to do. And that, that is self-deception that is called nominal Christianity. Nominal being in name only. From the Greek word namos, name. They are a Christian in name only. They claim to be one, but they don't have a life that squares up with it. They have a torch, and there's no oil in it. They're not ready to meet the Lord. I'm not preaching works-based salvation here. If it's a faith without works, then it's dead. Works do not save, but saving faith works. And we are to be busy working while our bridegroom is absent. Another unprepared fool will be one who tries to live a holy life without the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's an impossibility. That's an impossibility. We might be moral according to some standard, usually one we've handpicked and crafted for ourselves. Pretty easy to do. You know, it's interesting when you ask, when you're, when you're, when you're witnessing to, to sinners, you ask them, you know, why, why would the Lord um, not send you to hell? It's usually they, they give a number of the Ten Commandments, sometimes just one heard that before, and it's, but it's never all ten. I've kept all ten of these perfectly. Never heard somebody say all, all ten. The rich young ruler thought he had, and he was, he was messed up because he had missed number one. He had stuff as his God. So an unprepared fool is one who tries to live a holy life without the indwelling Holy Spirit. That self-deception is called moralism. A works-based righteousness, which is no righteousness at all. Just as useless as the dead faith that doesn't work. It doesn't lead to God either. So how do we prepare? 
Ask for the Spirit is the place we start. Ask for the Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, and we do, we do, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Like He's reluctant to give it? I don't really want to. I only have so much of it. No! No! The Holy Spirit, incorporeal, there's no limit to, to Him. He's glad to give Him to us. It's a, it's a rhetorical question. How much more? Immeasurably more. So, this day, while you're considering this parable with me this morning, ask for the Holy Spirit. Be filled. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me walk uprightly before the Lord. Don't sleep your life away by being distracted and consumed with the cares of this world. Plead with the Father and the Son. Fill me with the Spirit. By the truth, sell it not. That's no loss. People use the term my truth. That's more worthless than a wooden nickel. When we're told buy the truth and sell it not, it's between the covers of your Bible. Genesis to Revelation, that's the truth. Buy it and sell it not. And I'm not talking about just go buy a physical copy of the Bible and leave it on, on your uh, bedside stand at home. No, live in it. Live in it. Buy the truth and sell it not. Store it up in your heart so that, it, so that every function of who you are in your mind and with your hands is done out of fear of the Lord, expecting His coming when He will take account with you how you have lived before Him. Run the way of His commandments. Hasten and do not delay, says the ESV. Psalm 119.60, hasten and do not delay because He's coming. Even though it says he's delayed, we're not to delay keeping his commandments. So ask for the Spirit. Cry out with God for the Spirit of God to indwell you. As the bridegroom was delayed, verse 5, the bridegroom was delayed. We're not told why, we're not told how, and so it's not necessary for us to try to sort out why the delay is. To us it seems like a delay. Our, the span of our life is, the psalmist says, 70 years by reason of strength, 80. That seems like quite a while. But in, in, in the span of uh, eternity, Jesus hasn't waited very long on his bride. A few thousand years the earth has stood. Even if it stands 100,000 more, it'll be a blink of an eye for the Lord. And so, just as surely as the bridegroom is coming. He's delayed, but he's coming. He is coming. That's the point. The delay should not convince us that he's not coming. He is coming. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. They all became drowsy and slept. Five wise, five foolish, drowsy and slept. It's paradoxical that the second coming of Jesus, the parousia, is imminent and at the same time delayed. It's coming quick, but at the same time it's delayed. My uh, seminary professor for uh, eschatology, Sam Waldron, had a wonderful example. Uh, it's always stuck with me. I, I, I'm just, I'm going to give him credit and borrow it because it, it, I don't know how any way to put it better. But he said the second coming of Jesus Christ is like a great mountain in the distance. And you're driving straight at that mountain. And the mountain is so big and looming so large, you don't know how much distance is between where you are coming upon this mountain. Maybe a few miles, maybe thousands of miles. But you're coming straight at it. And because it is the, the second coming of Christ is the event that is the, the end of all events, it's the most monumental Just before the first coming, after the first coming, the bo both are important and essential. That we don't know how much space is between us and that mountain, but we know we're driving yet. It's looming large. And so our, our, our foreshortened vision shouldn't teach, well, I'm not, I'm not really coming to the end of my life. or I'm not, this, I'm not really coming near the second coming of Christ. Oh, no, you are. may seem like more distance than you think, but you are definitely coming. 
you're definitely coming up on it faster than you realize. So it's imminent, but at the same time, it's delayed. It's coming soon, but at the same time, there's a delay. It's paradoxical. And so because of the delay, they all became drowsy and slept. And it's interesting that none of the virgins are indicted for it. None of them are indicted for it. No, Jesus didn't say, well, you know, the, only the five foolish ones slept. No, they all slept. All of them. Sleep is not what separated the wise from the foolish. Sleep is necessary and essential to life. Very much so. If you don't sleep, you'll die. And God will make sure you catch up on it in the grave. So take some time to nap. Your, your college studies, yeah, they, they can wait. You know, take some time to nap. Um, if you manage your time well, you'll have time for sleeping. It's necessary and essential to life so that even if Jesus delays, we must carry on with the necessities of life. We must. If, if a man fails to provide for those of his own household, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel. He's worse than a foolish virgin. We have to take stock of the necessities of this life. We have to provide for our families. But at the same time we're doing that, we're prepared for the second coming of the Lord because he is coming again. We have plenty to do in the meantime. We must carry on with these necessities. To do any less is sin. The Lord's entrusted to us some property. We're to make good use of those talents. We're to invest them. We're to make advances with them in the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is like that. Verse 14 of chapter 25. It's like a man going away. and We're to use what the Lord's given us. So the sleep, it's, it's necessary. But what separated the wise from the foolish was their preparation for when the end of all these necessities of life comes. Because they are coming to an end. We're not going to have to work and buy bread. Because we're going to a land where, come, buy, without money and without price, Isaiah 55, 1. The groceries are free up there. And the shelves aren't empty when it snows. So we will not have to work and labor in that way for our sustenance. So do not let the physical necessities distract you and consume you from being prepared with spiritual necessities. They were prepared before they slept. They already had the oil and then they slept. Oh, but the foolish were sleeping and they still had something to do. They still had something to do for their duty, and they were unprepared. They were unprepared for it. And so, that's the second point. Just as surely as the bridegroom's coming, no one knows. They, didn't, they hadn't heard any word, and so they all fall asleep. They're tired, it's late, they're waiting up. They all fall asleep. They didn't know when he was coming. Five, for five of them, it didn't matter because they were ready. For five others, they were not ready. And they fell asleep, and it was tragic for them. They were distracted with the things of this life and failed to adequately prepare. Verse 6, but, but at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. The bridegroom is surely coming no one knows when. And the third point is you must be prepared. Because the announcement is going to be made. Here is the bridegroom. Just like we rehearsed. He's here. He's coming. Are you ready? Here is the bridegroom. All ten of these uh, virgins knew what their role was. What, what, do we, what do we read in verse 7? They rose and trimmed their lamps. Oh, we know what that means. The bridegroom's coming. Get the lamps ready. They knew exactly what they're due to us. They knew what was expected of them. And so they start trimming their lamps. Literally, it was their time to shine. So they're all trimming their lamps. Let's do this thing. It's a time to celebrate. And five of the virgins thought they were prepared, but they weren't. It's not enough to know what the Bible requires of you. That's a torch with no oil in it. You must obey its commands. Just hearing the gospel invitation doesn't mean you're ready to meet the one that issued it. All ten of them got the invitation to be a part of this wedding party, but only five of them were ready. Just hearing the gospel invitation is not enough. You must respond in faith. 
The command has gone forth to repent and believe the gospel. It's a command from your Creator. It's not something He hopes you would do. It's not something He's standing by waiting on your free will to exercise and do. It's not something that He really thinks you should do because of all the trinkets He's got in heaven for you. No, it is a command from your Creator to repent and believe the gospel, like 1730. Commands all men everywhere to repent. It's a command. Not good advice, not a suggestion, not something you should try. You are commanded by your Creator to do it. And if you don't, to borrow the language of Scripture, that is foolish. You are foolish. You are commanded to repent and believe the gospel. All ten of them start trimming their lamps. Ah. Some of them have no oil. No oil. And only now do they realize their foolishness. Before this point, they they thought they were just as well off as anybody else in the wedding party. But now they realize something's missing. Oh, something's missing. And so, sinner, I urge you, you do not know when the last time you will hear the gospel is. Will be. You do not know when that is. So each time you hear it, flee to the cross. Get right with the Savior. You do not know if you will hear it again. And hell is teeming. Like an anthill, a fresh anthill that's just been kicked. Hell is teeming with souls who want to hear the gospel just one more time. And it is not extended to them. The door is shut. And they fail to make preparation and then in this life for the eternal stay. And only now do they realize it. And so if you've heard the gospel, praise God. If a, if a family member, friend, pastor, someone has shared the gospel with you, praise God. Run to Him. Run to the cross. Run to Jesus and find forgiveness for your sins. And He will give you His Holy Spirit, the best of all donations. He will make you to live for Him. He will adopt you into His family. And now they realize their mistake. But they're still foolish. They don't realize it's too late to remedy it. There comes a point where we realize it's too late. Don't let that point be when it is too late. There's a time that comes when we realize we've made a mistake. Don't let that come when it's too late, what I meant to say. We've been going through the Gospel of John at 3 o'clock. During the 3 o'clock hour together, we're up to John 11. But Jesus, back in John chapter 8, verse 21, very sobering verses. Oh, it was, it was hard to preach these verses. John 8, 21. So he said to them again, the them is, are the, um, the Jews there. The Pharisees, in verse 13, who are, are antagonizing Jesus, he said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me. He's telling them what they're going to do. You're going to seek me. The one who now stands before you, who you hate, who you try to accuse of blasphemy because you hate me so much. You, the time is coming where you will seek me and you will die in your sin. There is such a thing as seeking the Lord to Late. That is a real thing, a real and tragic phenomenon that some seek the Lord too late. They realize their mistake. We have failed to bring the oil that is necessary for these lamps. And so there's no light coming out of this lamp. There's no oil. One day, one day, all the fools the world over and from the beginning of time to the end, who mocked the gospel, who spurned the generous invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and be reconciled to Him, to receive the free grace of God. All those who criticized the church of God, who despised His word, one day they will realize their mistake. They will beg of those prepared to prepare them in a moment. And it will be too late. It will be too late. So ask yourself, is this me? Am I unprepared for that day? Have I failed to prepare for that day that is coming? 
And it's not like we know when it's coming. All the more necessity to prepare, all the more reason to prepare now. Because I don't know the day. It's not on your calendar or mine. So prepare now. While we yet have breath in these lungs. Cry out to God. They know that they have not gladly bowed the knee and confessed with the tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now these foolish ones are going to be forced to bow the knee and confess with the tongue. But it won't be unto salvation. It will be the last thing they do before they experience the unmitigated wrath of God for all eternity for their disobedience. It's not like the Lord has left us to be prepared and failed to give us instructions. He said, well, I need you to be prepared He's given us 66 books of the Bible, the gospel replete in all of them. And we, if we fail to make preparation, it is not because God has not warned us. It's not because He's not been clear. They were foolish because they knew what they were to do. They knew what was required of them, but instead of preparing, they slept. Many today sleep. That is, we're busy with the affairs of life. I get it. Your life's busy too. I get it. Nathan only makes it busier, and I'm glad for it. But we're busy with our lives. We are. I don't get to see y'all during the week as much as I'd like because I'm just busy. You see, some of you, and it's a little foretaste of glory, and I'm glad for it. But we're busy. Souls are busy with the affairs of life. Even the heathen, they know their Creator's coming back to judge them. Why their guilty, guilty conscience nags them all the time. They know they've got guilt. They know they've got to do something with it. But run to the cross? No. 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 I'll get some, get some religion. That's a torch with no oil. I'll, I'll, I'll clean my life up. I'll try to live right and maybe the Lord will be impressing me. That's a torch with no oil. That's not going to help you. That's not preparing. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit. That's not preparing. So a fool gets religion, tells himself he has his torch, he's ready to light the way. He starts living a moral life. I've got my torch, I'm ready to light the way. And then when the time comes for the light to be lit, it is not going to light. You are unprepared. Unprepared. It will be too late. You have no oil. That's why I'm warning you now. Go. Cry out for God to give you the Spirit of God, to cleanse you by the blood of His Son. It's why we must heed this warning. It's why this parable is given to us. So that as we read it, we may prepare now for the coming day. What, one thing that makes a fool foolish, what makes a fool foolish is relying on the spiritual preparation of others to count for your own soul. For a long time, I, I, I was under this delusion. And only by the grace of God did I come out from it. I thought, my parents, they're Christians. They're some of the holiest people I know. We go to this church. I mean, Dominion Baptist Church. That's, you know, we we love the Lord here. And I say the catechism every week. And I'm homeschooled. You know, I don't don't do a lot of the, the nasty things other people do. I do actually a whole lot more. Did a whole lot more than many others that I know. And it's not trusting in any of those things. Those are all torches with no oil. Relying on the spiritual preparation of others. Your children, if your parents are Christians, praise God for that. You should praise God for that. That you're born in a Christian household where the Word of God is revered, where you're taught the Scriptures. Do not put any stock in that before the Lord. He is, when you ask Him, on, when He asks you on Judgment Day, why should I let you into my kingdom? Well, my parents are Christians. That is not going to open the door. Why should I let you? He's not talking about your parents. Well, you know, I I had Christian friends. Or I went to a Christian school. Or I was faithful to attend a biblical church, a godly church. None of those things will grant you access into the kingdom of the Lord. Those are torches without any oil. You are yet unprepared. Do not trust in those things. Faith in someone else's faith is not saving faith. It will not save you. Verse 10. Actually, we didn't go through verses 8 and 9. That was verses 8 and (laughs) 9. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. They see that the wise have prepared, but it won't work for them. And verse 9, the wise give an answer to this, saying, 
Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Some people see in verse, verse 9 an uncharitable attitude. They're, they're kind of selfish, aren't they? They're, they're stingy with this oil. They're not sharing any. Sharing and compassion are not the point of this parable. Okay, We're talking about something that cannot be transferred. You cannot transfer your regeneration to anybody else, much as you would like to. to, to I would love to, to put a little, take a little slice off mine and give it to my son. Can't do it. He's got to stand before the Lord, give an account for his own soul. I'm going to do all I can. God help me with all the strength he gives me to prepare him to do that. But it, it's going to be him and, him and his soul before the Lord. You cannot transfer any of it. They cannot give any of this oil to them. If they give some of their oil to the foolish and there's not enough, there's not going to be any lights on the processional. They have to do their duty before the Lord, before the bridegroom. And so they keep the oil that they have. No reason to see them as stingy. And they leave them with suggestion, go rather and buy. They're, they're not writing them off as a lost cause. It look like you guys are just going to be stuck here then. Go, go buy. Go buy. But mine is mine. And that's okay. Your testimony is your testimony. And I thank God for it. For the work the Lord has done in my brothers and sisters. It cannot be transferred though. It's non-transferable. Praise God, non-refundable either. But you can't give it to anybody else. They couldn't give their oil to anybody else. And so while they were going to buy, they took the advice of the wise virgins. They were going to buy. The bridegroom came. The announcement was right on point. Here he is. Those who spent their whole life despising the precious gospel of Jesus Christ will at the end forsake everything to go get it. They will realize none of these trinkets on this earth that they've accrued are going to count for anything. Doesn't matter how big your boat is, doesn't matter how big your bank account is, how big your closet is, how thick your wallet is, how many toys you got piled up, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the alphabet soup after your name, doesn't matter what buildings you've built, doesn't matter. None of that stuff will matter in that day. What have you done with the gospel? What have you done with the gospel? Are you prepared to meet the judge? Prepared to meet the bridegroom. They brought a torch. They knew needed oil. They failed to bring oil. If you know you need the Holy Spirit but refuse to prepare by asking God for Him, how can you expect to fare any better than these foolish virgins? You're deceiving yourself. So cry out to God. J.C. Ryle, heavy words. The mistakes that are not found out until that day are irretrievable. Hmm. Can't get time back once it's been lost. Can't get any of it back. There is an in and an out when it comes to the kingdom of God. They went to buy, but the bridegroom came. And we're not told that they found anything. So they run back. And those who were ready went in with the bridegroom. Those who were ready. Expecting His coming, prepared for His coming, they went into the marriage feast and the door was shut. And now there's a separation made. The consequences of what before was an unknown distinction. All, all ten looked ready. All ten were at the right place at the right time. But some of them were missing something. And now it's apparent what the difference is. And the door is shut. There is an in and an out when it comes to the kingdom of God. There is an in and out. We're not all God's children. We're all God's creatures, yes. We're not all His children. If we were all His children, why preach the gospel at all? We're all His children. That's an old liberal, nonsense, nonsensical view. We are not all His children. All His creation, yes, but not all His children. Are you prepared to meet the bridegroom? Which side of the door will you be on? That's the, that, that is the only question to concern our lives with. While we're attending to all the other necessities, that is the great question. Which side of this door will I be on? We can know and we can know how we know. We've been given the gospel, been told the Holy Spirit, the best of all donations is there for the asking. And verse 11, afterward the other virgins came. 
And we're not told they ever found any oil. Not told they ever found any. They remain fools still. It's midnight. The stores are closed. Nobody's open. 24-hour drive through olive oil sales. None of them didn't exist. There's no oil to be had. They didn't find anything. So they return with what they have to beg and plead for the Lord to open to them. They're casting themselves before Him, but they frittered away their time and will spend no time at the marriage feast. Oh, the tragic end of those who fail to prepare. But He answered, verse 12, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. Why, why this five and five distinction? Why are five on one side of the door and five on the other? Why is it not some other number? Why, is, why are the scales not tipped? Why is it not seven, three or six, four? I think it's important that it's equal distribution here. I'm going to explain why. Why there's five wise and five foolish. Let's tip the scale in either direction for a moment. And suppose that more of the virgins were foolish than wise. You have seven foolish and three wise, we'll just say. Well, then the reader of this parable may conclude that, well, if most are unprepared, I don't see how I could ever be a part of a prepared minority. It might lead them to despair, a horrible kind of despair. But suppose, let's tip the scale the other way. Let's suppose that most of the virgins were wise. We have seven wise and three foolish. Then the reader may conclude that, well, if most are prepared, I'm likely in that majority. So it keeps us from despair on one hand and presumption on the other because it's exactly equal distribution. Five and five. So I don't believe the number 10 has any kind of mystical meaning. It's just there's 10. That's still the size of some... Uh, bridal parties today. But it's an even number and it's even evenly distributed. I don't believe Jesus is teaching here that half of mankind will be saved. I don't know how many. I know it's an innumerable multitude in heaven. That's clear from Revelation. We won't be able to count them. But we also know that broad is the way that leads to destruction. There be many that find it. Narrow is the way that leads to life and there be few that find it. Matthew 7 13. But I believe the number is equal here because, or so that, no man can imagine any uneven ratio working to his advantage or to his disadvantage. We're called to prepare ourselves. And then these are chilling words. I do not know you. Chilling words. Jesus actually has spoken these words before to nominal Christians. If we go back to Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, verse 21 of Matthew 7, not, this is, of course, Jesus speaking, it's the Sermon on the Mount, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And John 6, 29 tells us what the will... What must we be doing to work the works of God? This is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He sent. John 6, 29. There it is. The one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. Verse 22. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? Empty torches. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. The work of God was not casting out demons and doing mighty works and prophesying. The work of God is believing on Him whom He sent. That's the work. Believing. Why, why, why do churches feel like we have to have you know, all these sessions of all these mystical, crazy things where we, well, frankly, the charismatics, where we have to perform all these skits and, and, and dramas and all this stuff? Can we not get back to just preaching the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do the amazing stuff of saving souls? Can we not get back to that? Verse 23, And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, the nominal Christian. I I thought I had my torch ready. I was doing all this stuff. No, depart from me, I never knew you. And that sense of no is to be affiliated with, 
Of course, Jesus knows who they are. They're his creation. He made them. He appointed all the days of their life. But it's, I did not know you in a a sense. You're not personally affiliated with me. You're a rebel. You're not a part of my family. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There's, There's what all prophesying and casting out demons and doing mighty works, there's what it is apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's lawlessness. Because God has not given the glory for any of it. It's lawlessness. Lawlessness. Chilling words. Jesus only knows those who are expecting his return. Lots of people want to be ready for when Jesus comes back. That's why eschatological views that kind of give you some roadmaps and warning signs are so popular. Like we talk about at the beginning. That's why. People foolishly think they can get their lives in order before Jesus comes back. Nope. If that's your plan, you are planning to fail. That's the only outcome of that kind of plan. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the Lord someday. I'll, I'll confess to him one day. No, you're planning to fail. It will be too late. The foolish virgins knew they were expected to meet the bridegroom and light the way. They failed to prepare for that, and they're scrambling while the door is shutting. If you're putting off asking the Lord to save you, with the, wash you in the blood of his son, you are, you are going to be caught on the outside of the door when it's too late. Life is not a football game. The clock doesn't stop with one second left for you to run a final play. You're, you're not going to get that. The Lord might save some of you in the 11th hour, and I will praise God for all eternity for that, but do not count on it. That is the sin of presumption. If your plan is to wait to the last second to prepare to meet God, you, that is a plan doomed to failure. You will be standing outside in the dark with the five foolish virgins. And all along, we've been talking about the foolishness of failing to prepare. And I believe that that is the definition of foolishness. I didn't look it up, but I'm going to give you mine. The definition of foolish is knowing what is required of you and doing anything else but that. That's the definition of a fool. Knows what's required of him and does anything else besides And so Jesus concludes this parable. He makes his own application. Watch therefore. What is the therefore therefore? It's there for you to draw this singular application. Watch. And it's a present active imperative in the Greek. Imperative means it's a command, present active. You're to be actively presently doing it now. Commanded to be actively presently prepared to meet the bridegroom. And he gives you, again, what he said before. Reason why. For you know neither the day nor the hour. You have an appointment, but it's not on your calendar. You will meet with your creator. He's not giving you the day or even the hour. Jesus has patiently delayed his coming. Many of us have heard the gospel many times, praise God. And so there's been a delay. But do not mock him by wasting the opportunities he has given you. Do not sleep your life away. Leave off nothing that helps you prepare. Seize the means of grace. Pray to be filled with the Spirit. Repent daily of your sins. Worship publicly and privately. Store away the Word of God in your heart. Fast. Study the Word. Fellowship with other saints. Be discipled by other saints. Leave off nothing of the means of grace. If it will help you prepare, seize it. Lay hold of it. For the day is coming. And you're going to... I would wish to think of all the time I wasted where I could have been preparing. So much time lost that I cannot get back. You have today for one reason, and that's to prepare for that day. I don't know why the Lord lets me live another day. To prepare you for that day. That's why. Today is not hopeless. Today is not an accident. Today is for you to prepare for that day. The bridegroom is coming. Time is an earthly tool that we use to prepare us for a timeless heaven. Melanchthon Jacobus, unreadiness for that day is without remedy. And so the, the, the fourth point, the unprepared will suffer the consequences of their foolishness. There's no second chance at getting to prepare. The door is shut. No other invitation will be extended they're not going to renew marriage vows and people get a second chance 
There's not a millennial reign where we get to Jesus comes on earth and some get a second chance to repent. No, no. The door is shut. His appointed man wants to die. After that comes judgment. So the foolish believes nominal religion is sufficient. The foolish cares more about physical necessities than preparing spiritual necessities. The fool relies on the spiritual preparation of others that it will somehow credit them. And the fool knows what is required of them and yet does anything and everything else. You don't have to tell me, but does that describe you at all? Are you failing to prepare? The bridegroom is surely coming. No one knows when, and so you must be prepared. Have the Holy Spirit saved you? Are you walking with your Lord, ready to meet Him? And then fourth point, or will you suffer the consequences of failing to prepare? Because this failing to prepare does have consequences. So I hope and pray that we've been adequately warned this day. So let's pray now. Spirit, oh, Holy Spirit, pray that you would take this word that has been preached. Lord, that you would uh, cause it to stick in our hearts and our minds, that we would walk before you humbly, any moment expecting our Savior's return. And Lord, that when he returns, he will find us busy about the business he's given us to do. Lord, I thank you for uh, the many opportunities you give us to hear your word. I thank you for your gospel that saves to the uttermost. I thank you for the blood of Jesus which cleanses us from all sin. I thank you that the, the, you restore the years the locusts have eaten. And that you redeem us from wasting our life, our, our time, our, our gifts and abilities. And that you make us your own dear children. Give us work to do in your economy. What a privilege. What a king to serve. So Lord, I pray that you would receive praise unto yourself this day. For you are a worthy king. You are a good king. And Lord, with joy we look forward to when the bridegroom will come. For his bride, the church. And oh Lord, fill us with joy till that day that with great expectation and longing we would long for that day. I pray these things in your name. Amen.